What have I got here? An ordinary cable for charging my device? A dongle for connecting to Ethernet? A nice innocent looking thumb drive? Actually, these might be malicious tools that could hack your computer. I just got back from DEF CON, an awesome hacker conference where you can learn how to pick locks, intercept internet packets to steal passwords, hack IoT devices, and war drive to collect all kinds of signals coming off all kinds of devices. Or maybe you just want to make blanket forts, or hire a violinist to walk around with you and create the ultimate soundtrack to your conference experience. You can do that at DEF CON too. One of the things that I dove into at this year's conference was tools that look like everyday devices but actually hide something more sinister. You may have something like this or something like this laying around and not really realize that it might actually be a nefarious computer itself. Darren Kitchen is the founder of Hack5, a company that makes all kinds of awesome gear to help people understand their own digital vulnerabilities. They are quite scary if you're not familiar with cybersecurity. In this video, we'll explore 10 hacking tools that they offer that you need to know about. We'll also look at how to tell if a piece of hardware can be trusted and we'll teach you how to protect yourself. Just a reminder that Hack5 didn't sponsor this episode, we actually don't do show sponsors, we thought that this was just really interesting equipment that people should be aware of so that they can better protect themselves in the digital world. Let's get started with the famous USB rubber ducky. You may recognize it from various TV shows and movies. A rubber ducky keystroke injection attack platform disguised as a thumb drive. Well, it looks to you and I like a flash drive. To a computer, it looks like a keyboard. And Computers inherently trust keyboards. You can plug this into the computer and it'll execute keystrokes that you can pre-program. It would bypass all standard countermeasures by emulating a plug-in keyboard. It's a great reason to not go plugging random thumb drives into your computer because they could be executing all kinds of malicious code. Next, the OMG cable. Lightning connection on one end that you'd plug into your iPhone and USB on the other. It looks and feels just like one that you may have, uh, but it's malicious. While to the eye, it's indistinguishable distinguishable from a normal cable, the big difference of course is that this one has a computer inside of it with a Wi-Fi access point that you can control from your phone or anywhere in the world and do malicious things with the computer that it's attached to. You can connect to them from your phone or laptop. You can use that to trigger payloads. Eep. Number three, the LAN Turtle. A simple USB Ethernet adapter that happens to have a little computer inside that provides an attacker with remote access into this device and thus remote access into your network. An attacker can plant this on a computer and have persistent remote access into that machine and also watch all of the data that's going in between and maybe even tweak some of the data. So it's like, oh, the computer's trying to go to this website. Well, let's send them to that website instead. Number four, we have the adorable Bash Bunny. This right here does similar USB attacks to the USB rubber ducky, except way more advanced. It does multi vector. So this can actually enumerate on the computer as not only a keyboard, but also storage, serial, and ethernet for Windows and Mac. So you can do attacks that are what we call bring your own network. The idea is I can carry multiple payloads on this. I can flip the switch right before I go up to my target, plug it in. It'll execute keystrokes. It'll show up as a network device. The computer is going to trust the network and say, oh great, can I get on your network? A network of two, just the computer and this, and then you can perform a bunch of network attacks. And it's actually a quad core Linux machine in here that also has geofencing with Bluetooth so you can set it up so it, you can trigger it remotely. You can do what's called exfiltration, which is a very fancy term for really an involuntary backup, you might want to call it. It's important to back up your data and, and a hacker might. For you. <laughs> For you. That's very kind. So with this device, there's numerous techniques to get information out of the computer and then save it to the SD card. Number five, the key crock. This is a very smart key logger. So unlike a normal key logger that you just plug in line between the computer and the keyboard, that's just going to record keystrokes. This will do that, but it'll also stream them on the internet to your own server and allow you to inject your own keystrokes. So you can remotely control the computer from afar injecting keystrokes at will. This is just a discrete little adapter that can plug in behind the computer. Number six. It's called the Screen Crab, and it gets screen grabs. It's got HDMI in and HDMI out, uh, powers over USB, and you can plug it in, say, behind the television. It will record the images to a micro SD card, 
and then it'll also stream it over the web, allowing you to see what's happening in real time. And it's self-hosted. Which means that no one else gets access to the data you're collecting, just you. Number seven, the Shark Jack. And this allows you to jack into a network, but it's actually for Ethernet. So you plug this into a network, flip the switch into attack mode, and then plug this into your laptop or your phone. And what will happen is this will boot up. It's a little Linux box with a bunch of pen testing tools and it will automatically do reconnaissance on the network. You can see what's happening live and get live actionable reports. There are ethernet jacks all over the conference center and the hotels uh, that are unattended. And it would take just moments to take one of these, flip the switch, the battery powered one makes it even easier, plug it into the network and the light will change color depending on what you've programmed it to do, what kind of actions. Remember, all of these tools are double-edged swords that can also be used to help people troubleshoot problems. They could just give it to unskilled people and say, hey, just plug these in and if the light turns red, mark down where that was and we'll remediate. Finally, we have two high-powered tools that you're not going to mistakenly plug in, but your computer might mistakenly connect to them via Wi-Fi. Number eight is the Wi-Fi Pineapple. The Wi-Fi Pineapple is a rogue access point. You might want to call it a hotspot honeypot. Your phone, your tablet, your laptop probably remembers every Wi-Fi network it's ever joined in the past and is constantly looking for those networks. It's the reason why when you go home, your devices automatically connect to your home network. So how does your phone see if one of your remembered networks is nearby so that it can automatically connect? Your phone is sending out what's called a probe request. And that's where your phone is basically shouting out, I'm looking for Naomi Brockwell's home Wi-Fi network. It shouts out something similar for every network that you have ever remembered in the past. And it does this at all times, as long as your Wi-Fi is on. What the Wi-Fi pineapple does is it listens for all of these names of networks and then spoofs them. It would respond back and say, oh yeah, that, that's me. Mm -hmm. That's me, you should connect to me, I'm that network. And your phone will then automatically connect to the Wi-Fi Pineapple. When clients' devices connect to the Wi-Fi Pineapple and it'll provide them with internet access, you as the operator get to what we call a man in the middle attack. You get to see what's going on in between and you can manipulate the traffic. You can also use this to perform a lot of Wi-Fi attacks where you can kick devices off networks and there's a lot of modules that allow you to inspect the data and see what's going on with what websites people are visiting. You'll also glean a lot of interesting information just by seeing the names of all of the networks someone's phone is calling for. If their device is looking for certain hotel networks and certain uh, airline networks and certain corporate Wi-Fi networks and maybe some other corporation guest Wi-Fi networks, you can determine who they fly with, um, you know, who they work with, who that company might also be partnering with or potentially partnering with and working with based on those guest Wi-Fi networks. Number nine is a super-powered version of this device. This is the Wi-Fi Pineapple Enterprise. This is uh, that except uh, with so much more horsepower made for uh, very large and busy Wi-Fi environments, kind of like the very hostile network environment we're in here at DEF CON. <laughs> Our Wi-Fi Pineapple software has a lot of features that allow you to find what are the vulnerable devices in my environment. And finally, there's the Wi-Fi Coconut, a brand new device that's like the pineapple but on steroids. Wi-Fi uses the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz frequencies, but there aren't just two channels to monitor for Wi-Fi signals. There are 14 2.4 gigahertz channels. A normal radio can only listen to one channel at a time. It would listen on channel one and then it would hop over to channel two and listen on that and while it's on each channel listening, it's ignoring 13 other channels. So you were never able to get an entire big picture of all of the channels in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum simultaneously. The Wi-Fi coconut monitors all of the 2.4 gigahertz channels. This is constantly listening to all of them. Channels one through 11 are used in the United States. Channel 12 and 13 are only supposed to be used in Europe. And channel 14 is only supposed to be used in Japan. Why are only 1 through 11 meant to be used in the United States? There's this thing called the ISM ban, the Industrial Scientific and Medical ban that the FCC way back in the day made, but they gave it to the general public to use that spectrum and there were a few caveats to it about the 
way that they could use the spectrum, the uh, modulations and the power and the different channels. Uh, and that's a long-winded way to say that in the United States we use 1 through 11 and in the rest of the world they use 1 through 13 and in Japan they get to be special and use 14. You can see here that the Wi-Fi coconut is seeing a lot of traffic on all of these channels. If you watch this for a while, you'll actually see a little bit of traffic on the Japanese channel because I feel like there might be some non-law-abiding hackers in the area. So now the most important part of the video, how can we protect ourselves? Starting with the pineapple and coconut, the takeaway is to absolutely turn Wi-Fi off when you're not using it, lest you accidentally connect to one of these traps instead of a real Wi-Fi network. You should also forget all Wi-Fi networks after you disconnect from them. And you should not allow your phone to automatically connect to any Wi-Fi network. It will be annoying because you'll have to click a button when you return home instead of having your device automatically connect, but to leave it open is a huge privacy and security vulnerability. Next, there are tools that can actually tell us whether a cable is malicious or not. This is a malicious cable detector, and the way that it works is, I'll take this normal benign cable and plug it in, and the light doesn't light up. But if I take this cable, which I know is malicious, it goes red and lets us know that there's data being transferred through here and it really shouldn't. This works against a lot of uh, illegitimate cables that you may find roaming around the internet. This provides data blocking. Not only is it gonna detect that it's malicious, but it's gonna prevent your computer from getting hacked. Final piece of advice, you should be careful what you plug into your devices. Don't be afraid of this, but be mindful of it. Know that it's out there, know it exists. If you're charging a device, for example, only use your own cables. Maybe you don't uh, pick up a cable that you find on the floor, or if you find a, a USB drive in the parking lot that has something enticing written on it, like salaries or something, Maybe think twice before plugging it into your computer. Accepting electronics from strangers, even things that look as benign as a cable, is kind of like taking candy from strangers. You probably shouldn't do it. Tools like this may seem scary, but they show us where the vulnerabilities are in our systems so that we can fix them. It's a good thing to have these things that uh, break stuff. So go forth and be a little more mindful of the seemingly innocent hardware around you. One day, it might just save your digital life.